Right, so we'll start with some introductions. Um, I'm Eeks, I'm Eeks on Drupal.org, I'm Eeks on Twitter, I'm Eeks on GitHub, I'm Eeks on GitLab, I'm Eeks everywhere. Um, and I've been using Drupal since 4.6, um, and I make, I'm a freelancer, works on projects for the better world, usually back end, but sometimes it's small NGOs, so then I'm a full snack developer. Um, what about you? Um, who here has made a custom entity? Put your hands up. Okay, so most people haven't done so. Those people who do do so, do you do it regularly? No, right, okay. Um, and how many people do do PHP programming? Hands up. And happy with object orientated? A few less. Okay then. Um, so, kind of about the right aim for the talk, to be honest. Um, I'm going to do everything from scratch. The first part of it, we will have a custom entity before we're halfway through the talk, and we'll have used it, and it's all going to be good. <laughs> um, we'll look into more detail afterwards. But, and when we go into more detail, there'll be more code. But I'll explain all the bits of code. But if you've got some idea of inheriting objects, then it's really quite simple. Um, and if you are, if you've done it more often, it should there should be something new for you at least. Okay, so first of all, why you should use custom entities? Um, well, I'll actually start. Oh God, I'm chopping off there. Oh. Shout if it steals a bit that it shouldn't do. Um, we'll start off with when you don't want to use them. Um, if you actually do want nodes. Um, Nodes come with stuff like access control with the grants. Um, the node access control, that's on its way for entities, but it's not there yet. Um, if you really do want taxonomy terms, um, like you want hierarchy in a lookup table, or you want media entities, so you've got your media entity type, and you want different plugins for the different types of media, or you want users, you actually want your entities to log in. Um, or, you want a custom entity that someone else has already written, like group module. Or the example I was going to use for this presentation, and I was about to write it, um, is it's really, ha you know, if you use blocks on the website now, you have content blocks, and the editors can edit the content blocks, but they go in the database, and they're a real problem to stage, because sometimes you want blocks that don't change so often, and you want them to go into configuration, so you can put them in your Git, and then you can deploy them on different sites. So a really good example of a simple custom block would be a configuration block, a simple block that works in configuration, not in content, and someone's gone and written it. <laughs> so it's on Drupal.org, it's called simple block. Um, so I won't be using that as my example here. But for anything else, if you don't need the stuff with, from nodes and all the rest, Custom entities should, should and probably will become your default entity. If you want a taxonomy term, use it. But the rest of the time, you want to use something else. So, um, you, you want to use them when you want a really simple entity um, that doesn't have a title, date, owner, revisions, access control, status, public URL, or it does want some of them, you just want to use the ones that you want or when you want a better admin user experience. Have you ever made a website where you then make lots of different node types? But actually the node types aren't really all the same, you know, some of the articles are something are completely different, and you want them in different places on the admin interface. In fact, you might want them in different places because they want to have different permissions. So some admins see this and some admins see that. Um, I'll give some concrete examples on the next slide. Um, so it's really hard to separate them out if they're all nodes or they're all taxonomy terms. Um, and in fact, it makes much more sense architecturally because if you're bothered, it's not only where you show them on the admin page, it's also where they go into the database. They're separate, so you've actually got a better architectural model for the future. Um, and then the last one is the opposite of the first one. You can have really simple entities that don't have all the trappings of a node, but you can also have really complicated ones that do um, lots of extra things so you don't have to use lots of hooks. So, 
if that sounds a bit abstract, the real use cases. Um, you can have small bits of reusable content. So the f I asked around, why do you use custom entities to a few people? And the ones that came back all the time were these small ones, like um, carousel slides. You want to have an entity that will just have the bits for the carousel slide or the reusable bits of content that you just refer to by reference all over the place in paragraphs or in blocks and you don't want them to be accidentally indexed so someone does a search on Google and they get a search result and they go to node 1234 and it's got your fragment of content um, and it's completely out of context and your lovely professional website for a government looks like a disaster. Um, so you can have them on an admin URL with access control on them and you can just reuse them in the correct places. One example of that, and I'll read this because it's someone else's example, was they made a site, it was for a campaigning NGO, and they wanted reusable calls to action instances that either appeared in blocks or, ref or references in paragraphs and it made the user experience for the admins much easier because it's one of those NGOs where it's very tightly controlled. Very few people need to make the calls to action, but lots of people need to reuse them. And they could just make a new paragraph, click on it, and reference the one that they wanted in the location they wanted it. Another example that came up twice, one is a site I've built, um, was, and one is another person, is locations. So locations, they're an entity, you know, they have things like addresses and points and information, um, but um, they're not articles like nodes and they're not taxonomy terms, they're something else. Um, in my case, they were attached to groups and events. Events have a location, groups have a location. In the other example, which we're effectively going to build in the next 10 minutes, um, is points of interest. And the thing about points of interest is you have different types of points of interest. So they have different fields. So one point of interest will have one type of field and another one will have different types of fields. That would be more content types if you were doing it with nodes. Um, so we'll see that. Another site I've built recently had products on it, but we weren't going to sell them on the site. So we don't need commerce and we don't need all of that. So we just make products and we make a product entity type and you can have different types of products and different fields on it. Um, another one that I did last year was subscriptions. So the subscriptions are associated with users, so it's like a profile field, but the subscription could be for the whole family. So then you've got multiple users sharing the same subscription. Um, and this was a classic case of where we wanted more control because it then had to synchronise with a customer relationship management system, a CRM at the other end. So every time people change things on the subscription, we needed to do an action to push this information or pull it from the CRM. So having your own entity makes it much easier. But we're going to start off with the nice simple bit and look at a location example. And it's really easy. Um, we're going to do, we're going to make that custom entity in code. We're going to configure it. We're going to make bundles, so these are locations, so we'll make two types of location. We'll put some fields on it. We'll post a couple of real locations. And we'll build a view that actually uses it. Um, and we'll do it all in under seven minutes with me explaining it. <laughs> OK. Um, but just before we start, the tools. So this is the most important one. Who's used Drupal console. So a few people you know it, right? Those people that don't know it, it's a bit like Rush. Um, but the most useful bit of it is the framework tools that roll out code. Um, and you can get it from there. I'm putting the slides online. There's a link to where the slides are at the end, so you can just look it up. Um, and I get it out of the Drupal Composer project. So when I install a new Drupal 8 site, I always just use this project and it includes the correct version of um, console, the correct version of Drush, and lots of other stuff for that project. So when you see me start typing, um, it's actually a video, but when you see me start typing and I go into the dot dot vendor directory, it's 
been supplied by the project. Okay, now it would be nice if this was actually showing the screen. If I go full screen, no, nope, it's still chopping it off. Should I risk for wanting to see the whole screen? Uh, I'm just trying. Yeah. I don't. Uh, should I risk changing the? You need to increase the font anyway, so we just set it right. Um, no, the actual well, the actual thing should. Let's just change the resolution and hope that it helps. That'll help. Yeah, it's all on there, and then if I full screen that, this might be slightly better. It's very difficult navigating from down here. Yes. Is it full screen? And the reason to do this is so I don't have to do a live demo, which would then not go wrong. Ah, thank you. <laughs> yes. Okay. Is that still visible in the light? So. Um, Can we switch off some lights? Is, is there some light switch there? Yeah, it's one as well. Whoa! Yeah. It's either on or off, I take it. <laughs> but now we can read it. That's good. <laughs> okay, so I'm just about, if I can find my own cursor. Where are you? There we go. I'm just about to run the console just to show. Um, all the commands, you'll see there's a, a load of commands um, and yeah this is where you'll see that it actually overlaps a bit with Drush but what we're most interested in is all these generate ones um, and so the first thing I'm then going to go and do is run the generate command be nice if I have my notes, thank you very much um, and I'm going to generate a module to put the new entity into. So it's just going to be called Location Entity, which is a dumb name, but that's what it shows. The only thing I don't let it automatically do is make the theme um, files, just because then I'd have to mix, use the theme files from this and the theme files from the, um, from the, field, from the entity itself. So that's the only thing I say no to, everything else is just the defaults. Although we do have, so that's already made it, you like. Um, so you've just made a module already, problem solved. Um, now we just generate a content entity. Um, which will give a slightly better entity name. And it's going into the default admin structure path, but we'll change that later on. I'm going to have bundles so that we can have different types of location. And again, accepting all the defaults. And this, this means I do accept translations and revisions, which adds lots of files. If you just do a simple config entity, it's like nine files. If you do a content entity with everything, then you get a lot of files. Anyway, so you can see it's not there yet. Now I'll just enable the module. And it should appear. Fresh. And there it is. And we're done, basically. 
but I'm going to prove to you that it does all work and if you're just a site builder that's all the code that you actually need to do because we're now be able to use this new content type. We're going to add two bundles, two types for the location. Uh, one of them is a museum and museums will have fields on them, just a simple field for the opening times. And it only has one set of opening times, so that's nice and easy. And then we'll make a second one, which is a football stadium, stadiums. And of course, they have a different set of fields, like, for example, which clubs play there. And that will be a multiple field. There we are, and make it a multiple field. There we go. So now we've got our locations, and you just think if, you, if you're going to have locations with your stadiums and your um, things mixed up in with all your other content types, it gets way too confusing. So, we'll now add one of each, so that we've got some content to show in our view. Now this is where you get my massive local knowledge stolen from Wikipedia. I know nothing about football, but <laughs> that is a local football stadium and that's the first division women's football team. And there's also a lower division football team that plays there. And you'll see out of the box, you've got a location list, and it's worth pointing out, you've got that nice menu link to go to create new ones in the admin. So it's very good for admin type pages. I will talk about how you can put the links elsewhere when we look at the code a little bit. So there you go. We now have two locations in our list. You'll probably want to override this with a view so you've got more details for your admins. But that's the default one that you get out of the box. And we created it with all the fields by default. Now, I'll show you how you can get rid of some of the fields in a bit. But for now, you can still, like you would normally do in the UI, change which fields are enabled or disabled or displayed. So, but you can actually change it in the code as well. And here, just to prove that views works, we could make an admin view to replace that default one, but we'll make a simple, page, you can see our new entity is available there. We could choose from the bundles, but we'll show them all. We only make two items. And show the location entity, because it'll be quicker. And save it. And then I unnecessarily resave the page for some reason. And then visit the locations, and it should be there. There you go, and there are our two, shown up, and done. So, and then zoom in. So, that was under seven minutes, and so that's it. in under seven minutes, and we've created the entities. We've done everything, so for a lot of your use cases, that's all you need to do. Um, in fact, there are the two commands that you need. Um, you use the Drupal console to generate a module, and you use Drupal generate entity content, which is the content entity, or the config entity. The difference between the two, most important difference for you, is the config entity um, you can't put fields on, well you can put fields on and we'll show you how to do that in code in a second, but you can't do it in the admin interface and the, con and, um, the 
config entity goes into your configuration, so it exports when you do Drush config export, and the content entity goes into your database, and you can do stuff with the storage, which we'll see in a second as well. So, a bit of code. Doop, doop, doop. Yeah, there we go. So this is the entity file that was created. So how many people said they were sort of comfortable well, how many people would be comfortable finding this file? If I can see in right, so some people, some people not. Okay. Um, so um, it, how many of those people who are on if those people are comfortable finding it, how many of you would have done it because you use an IDE? As in PHP Storm or something like that. For people who can't see, there's only a few hands up actually. Um, and of the people that wouldn't know where to find it, do you have, how many of you do have an IDE? So PHP Storm, Eclipse, something like that. One or two hands, okay. That de the IDE will definitely make your life easier if we're using Sublime Text or Nano or something else. It's slightly harder to navigate around to find these files that have got generated. Um, you can, like, I'm, I, it's a bit of a nerd sport, but I still use Vim. Um, but it means I've got loads of plugins and things so that I can magically navigate around the namespace structure. But if you haven't, You've just generated the files. You know what module they're in. So it's in, been put into my modules custom. It's called location entity. And then you'll find it always makes a source directory. And then inside the source directory, there's another directory called entity, which matches up with the namespace for the fact it's going to have all the entity information in it. And then the file itself is named after the, cla after the class itself. Um, it's a standard that's also used in SIP, it, well, it comes from a, an agreement across most of PHP, this is how we're going to structure the files, it's called PSR4. Um, and the reason for it is not to make our life difficult to find things underneath, it's to make it really easy for the autoloader, so whenever the class is needed, the program itself knows where to find it because it's always in this structure. But yeah, you should be able to find it if you go to the module, look in the source directory, and then look down from there. If you get an IDE, it will just make your life really easy. The whole world seems to use PHP Storm. I prefer open software. <laughs> okay. So, I'm doing that. Anyway, so we look at the location entity now that we've found it. At the top of the file, is something called annotations. So those people who've been doing PHP, or anyone, have you come across annotations before? Hands up. Ooh, now ah, that's way more hands. Brilliant. Uh, for those people, the few people that haven't seen it, it's literally the configuration, but it's put in a comment at the top of the class. Um, and you can see in this configuration, so it starts with the act here, um, and then, I need to be on here, so I can scroll through it. You can see it has the ID, um, it has the label, which is what's shown to the, um, the administ administration interface. Um, and it has some handlers. I'll briefly mention the storage. You can see this one, it just used the one in core. So a lot of this stuff, it can just use the stuff in core, it doesn't have to do anything. In fact, it didn't have to override the storage as well either, but it does because of the revisions. Um, and most of this stuff you don't need to touch unless you want to extend it. Um, what we will look at in the next five minutes, ten minutes, are the forms, which are written here. I haven't put in a slide about the access, but if you look inside the access class, you can see that while you don't have all the node grants and all that sort of stuff, um, what you do have is on the loading and saving of the entity, you can check permissions, but you can also check to see if a field, a field has been full, filled in or has a certain value, so you can make it available differently. Um, 
And we also will look at do, 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 here. These are the paths. So I said we accepted it being an admin structure, which was where it turned up on the page as well. It could have been in admin content. In fact, we'll do that later. Or quite often, if it's something you don't, it's something you want the general public to access, like no one, two, three, four, you could just change here the value and make it location entity, location entity, and that would change where it is. And then underneath the annotation, the comment, are all the methods. So these are the functions inside the class. I've split them up into two. So those of you who are used to the object-orientated programming, which is quite a lot of people, the first set here are overriding something that we've got from core. So if you look at content entity base, that's where most of the methods are. Most of the stuff like saving it at the entity and all the rest of it, you don't need to do anything. You saw it just works. Um, we will look at the pre-save that it's written and see why it's overwritten it and what else we could do. Um, and we'll look at base field definitions because that's the important bit where you can add or delete fields. Um, all the rest you can look at if you need to do something special, you can extend the base class. The stuff underneath it are for the fields that we added and Drupal Compose is a very good object orientated programmer um, so it automatically generated getters and setters for all the extra fields that it added. Like I said, we might not want all those fields, we might want to delete them, but it's easier to delete them in it than it is to write them. Um, and so it does actually make an interface and do, say all instances of our location will have getters and setters inside each one of those functions. All it does is call the set method on the entity and save the value. So, if you want to have the argument of oh, good getters and setters a good reason, I don't know. Anyway, so we'll look at the pre-save and the um, fields. So, we'll jump into the pre-save one. You can actually see it just runs the parent, so the object orientated people. It just runs actually all the pre-save that's in core. And the only reason it overrode it was to add the translation owner and the revision user owner. Um, if we didn't have translations and revisions, it wouldn't need to do anything. It wouldn't need to be there at all. However, in our example, and this is why you might want to do it, in a location, when you save the location, maybe you've got an address on it, and you want to send it off to get it geocoded, to get a point to then put back onto the entity, and you can do that in pre-save. It gets called by the storage class just before it saves it. So it's in, in how many people are doing Drupal 7? Not many. A uh, few. Okay. And you've written lots of hook um, ent um, node or entity pre-save and things. And you can come in here. You can still do that in Drupal 8, but if it's your entity and you're in control, it's a much neater place to do all that kind of stuff here. And if you don't want to, it's fine. Um, okay. So, now on to adding a field. So, this is the second method I said I'd look at inside that entity. And it's called base field definitions. And you can see this is where, again, it takes the fields that are default on the entity and then it adds in a user ID, which is an entity reference um, that has the label authored by, things like that. Um, if you don't want these fields, you can delete them and remember to delete the methods and any references to them. Um, but we'll also use them as a template for putting our extra field on, where I'll go into more detail. So yeah, it's adding that, it's adding a name, which is a string, um, it's adding the status, which is a boolean, okay, and so we'll add one of our own. So like I said for the example, it's a location and locations have a point, 
and we, we want this to be on all the bundles. So we can create this in the code, um, and it's a field supplied by the geo field module. So the type, the create up there, is geo field. If you're not sure what the name of the field is, guess what? It's at the top of the annotation in the field class. Um, so if you just go and search for the field class, which will be in source, um, plugins, field, and then the name of the class, it will say what the ID is. The next section, the set label, set description, set default value, I've copied and pasted from the other ones in base field definitions. And I've just changed point, geographic location, whatever. The next one's set default op display options. You might wonder where on earth do I get like geo field default? Um, geo field that long? Technically, I think the correct answer is you go and look in the code and you see how it's set. Um, I just made it in the UI, exported it. You do a Drush config export, looked at the YAML file and found the settings and just copied them across. It's much easier. And I suspect most people do that. So that's how to work out what kind of default settings you might want. Okay, after changing it, the field won't appear yet. And we're back to using Drush. I said I prefer Drush. Um, if you run, there's a command that works with new versions of Drush that are for Drupal 8 called Drush Entity Updates. And if you run that, it'll update the entity. You can see it says location entity entity type needs to be updated and the point needs to be installed. Do you want to do that? Yes. And there it is, just underneath the name as configured. So it's like, what, 10 lines of code, and it's actually in code, and it's better than the one that you put on there in the admin interface. For one, it's shared across all your bundles properly, and two, I wonder if anyone, so this is the SQL database, this is the table for that location entity, can anyone tell me why this is cool? Yeah. You have your stuff grouped together. Yeah, so if you make um, one in the admin interface, it makes a whole new table for you. Um, and then it does a join. So you have the entity one and you have um, another table which is called entity name underscore underscore field name. Um, and then you have lots of joins. If you make um, single value, um, fields directly on a content entity, it actually goes into the database there. Um, so it's one less join if you're bothered about stuff like that. It also keeps stuff together. Um, and if you are bothered about stuff like that, in the future, um, you can do lots more things about the schema and control it. Um, for example, you can add indexes to your database to make the queries better. Um, or you can change the queries themselves. And you can just do that by changing the, and overriding the classes in that annotation. If you want examples of that, just look at the node module. Okay. So, you'll also see it magically appears on the form. We, in the Drupal world, we're used to the fact it just appears on the form. But, you know, it doesn't everywhere else. You actually have to add form fields. And we had overridden the form over there in the annotation, but there it had just extended the content entity form and added in, but it gets all the fields in the first place. It added one more checkbox for is it a new one to make a new revision? Here we could do our transcode, we could do our show a map, um, add a map onto the thing, pick a point, we could do all that stuff rather than installing a plugin to do it. So you can change your form. Less Hook form alters. Brilliant. <laughs> okay. Last one. And this is very common. This is something you might have to do even if you're not making custom entities. You want to move stuff around. Um, and I said it's one of the reasons you actually want to make custom entities. To control that. So in the annotations we said we could change the URL. 
So it could, be ad it could be admin content. But if you changed it to admin content, it's not going to move. It's still going to be a structure. This the link will say admin content. It's because there's another file. It's in the top level of your new module directory called module name, links, menu, YAML. And you can see it says the parent is the admin structure. And we want it to be in admin content. If you're asking, what on earth is that? <laughs> so the URL, the link, which you looked at first, is one thing. And then it's associated with something called a root. And these are the root names. So system.admin content is the root name. And you can give it any URL, you can change it. Um, next question is, where on earth do I find these things? Well, the easiest thing is just look at another example that's on that page and see where it is. <laughs> and see what it says its parent item is. The correct answer it is usually inside the modules, there's something called a root.yaml file and it will say which roots it declares. But some of them are dynamically made. And then you'd have to, then you can actually go to an event which is in the Drupal root subscriber. There's a root alter and you can look at them all or you can dump them all to screen. But if you're just starting, the easiest thing to do is just look for something else that's on the page and see what its parent is. So we changed the menu item and it's not there. But we moved it under content. Why? Because it is there. And you'll notice the core messes this up. It's in the content menu, but you only see the sub-items of content if you're in this split view. And you can see the comments are on both, but files are only a tab and comments aren't. And our location entity list is there, but it's not on the tabs. If you're in the keynote, you will have heard Ancha mention wanting to change the way that the menu, the admin menu is, and this is the first thing they want to tackle. So if you ever change the content structure layout or have to do anything with it, fill in that survey for a couple of minutes and say what you do so we can make it slightly less... Huh? Anyway, so we, we need a tab as well. So it's in a similar name thing, except it's not menus, it's task, because tasks are tabs, usually, but not always. Um, <laughs> And I've just copied the root names into it, so it's exactly the same content. And now it appears. Boom. Okay, so, fair bit of stuff there. So, to summarise, what did we do? We created custom entities, um, which was two lines on the command line. We configured them, which is actually, you can just do it in the GUI. Um, and we used them, we made views, Worked out how you can start to find the classes if you need to do something else. Um, and once you're in there, you've got the configuration and the things that you can change on there. Worked out how you can, you've got, you've got all of an entity for free, all the code, you've inherited most of it from core, but you can extend some of the things if you need to. You can add native fields, you do need to add native fields if you're doing it with a config entity. Um, and we've extended the form, added things to the form, and we've changed the menu structure. Quite a lot. Okay, so, we go back up. Are there any questions? Does someone want to switch the lights on? <laughs> I can see you now. Seeing those hands with you sort of a bit... Uh, I think I was right. Most people here kind of got the programming bit of it. Any questions on it? Nope. Everyone's kind of got to the end of the conference. Okay. So, um, I'll say thank you. So, yes, I'm eeks on everything. And these slides, if you want to look up any of the links or where the console is or look at, you know, how we change things are up on x.gitlab.io, Drupal-custom-entities-presentation. So, thank you very much.